Now I want to take a look at inverse trig graphs. Uh, here's the sine function. Sine of zero is zero, and we can see the graph moving through here. We've got a couple different coordinates on that graph. Um, if I want to find the inverse function, and of course the inverse function, uh, we could call that f prime of x uh, equals inverse sine of x, something, something like that, an inverse sine function. Uh, what's really happening here is each input and output in the original graph switch, or each x and y switch. So technically, if I wanted to make a table of what was happening here, uh, I could really just switch coordinates. Uh, so an input of 0 gives me an output of negative pi. Uh, an input of negative 1 gives me an output of negative pi over 2. Uh, an input of 0 gives me an output of 0. An input of 1 gives me an output of pi over 2. Uh, an input of 0 gives me an output of pi, and so on and so forth. I can plot a few points here. Uh, now, I have to extend my graph just a little bit to do that. We're saying this is 1, saying this is 2, uh, we're saying 3 goes up above that, and uh, same kind of thing going down here. I need a little bit more space here. Okay. So I can plot a few points, and you're going to see there's a definite relationship again. Uh, for example, if I plot uh, the point 0, 0, that's going to be on both graphs. Um, if I plot the point at 1, uh, it's going to have an output value of pi over 2. Now, pi over 2 is about 1 and a half. Pi is about 3.14, of course. Uh, so if I go over about 1, it's going to be about right here. Uh, I have to go up about one and a half, so that's going to be a point something like this right here. Um, then if I go to, oh, notice by the way that I have a point both at zero negative pi, well I have a point at zero zero, I have a point at zero negative pi, I also have a point at zero pi. Um, so basically you can see that up here around zero pi there'd be another point like this. Uh, basically what's going to end up happening and uh, meanwhile, over at negative 1, I'm going to have a point at negative pi over 2, which is about negative 1 and a half. Uh, so I have something that looks about like this. Um, so what you're actually going to see here is a graph that looks like the sine curve. Uh, basically, the graph is going to go something kind of like this. And then you would see it go like that. And you'll see it hook around. to do something kind of like this. Um, now you'll notice something. I did not continue my graph all the way around here. So really what's happening, visually, I'm getting a graph that looks like a sine curve turned on its side. Okay, because I switched the x and y axis, the inputs and the outputs. Uh, but you're gonna notice something here. I did not draw in this part of the curve and I have not yet drawn in the part of that curve. Why? Because that would not be an inverse function. It wouldn't pass the vertical line test. Okay? Uh, so the interesting thing about the inverse sine function is the inverse sine function does not include any other points other than just these values. So y equals inverse sine of x, which is the function I've drawn here, is only defined from input values from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. And so that's something that takes a little getting used to, but if you look at your graphing calculator, you'll see that that's the graph that's made uh, because it always gives you functions. And so visually, it, it basically just looks like a sine function turned on its side. Again, technically it looks more like this, um, but we're only seeing a little bit of it because we're only using the part that's going to create an actual function. But that's how you can show the graph of an inverse sine function.
I'd like to look at the inverse cosine graph very quickly. Uh, this, of course, is the graph of cosine of x. You can see that I have a table for the function cosine of x over here. The inverse function is really just going to flip-flop the inputs and the outputs. So I've switched the x and the y values. Um, if I start plotting these points, you're going to see I'm going to plot certain values. Um, for example, I can plot the point 1, 0, and that's going to give me a point right here. Um, I can plot the point 0, pi over 2. Uh, that's going to show up about right here. Negative 1, pi, that's going to show up a little bit uh, above 3, something kind of like that. And 0, 3 pi over 2 uh, is going to show up at about uh, this point right here. Now, what you're going to end up with is a graph that, again, looks like a cosine function turned on its side. It's going to go something like this. You'll notice something, though. Once again, uh, it, well, you'll notice a few things. First of all, notice this doesn't pass the vertical line test. Okay, so actually the cosine function cuts off at a y value of pi, which is what this is right here. Uh, in other words, just a little bit bigger than 3 on the graph. Um, and meanwhile, same thing happens. If I continued down here with some of these other points, uh, you would end up getting something that didn't pass the vertical line test again. So the inverse cosine function looks something kind of like this. Different interval than the sine function because of having to pass the vertical line test. It's, uh, this function is actually defined from 0 to pi. And so that is what the inverse cosine looks like. Again, it's really just a sideways cosine function, except we can't use the, uh, the entire function or it won't pass the vertical line test. I can do similar things to graph the inverse tangent function. Uh, if I wanted to graph y equals inverse tangent of x, uh, again, I can plot points. For example, 0, 0 is on the tangent graph, so it'll be on the inverse tangent graph. Um, for example, the tangent of pi over 3, tangent of 60 degrees, is equal to radical 3. Um, so meanwhile, uh, that value on the other graph, you basically switch those input and output values. So uh, basically what's going to end up happening here, as x approaches pi over 2, the y value approaches infinity, that's going to flip-flop. As the x value approaches infinity, the y value is going to approach pi over 2. So that's going to look something kind of like this, with an asymptote taking place right here. And then the same kind of thing, uh, it's going to approach negative pi over 2 as y approaches negative infinity. So it's going to be this kind of S-shaped graph that looks something like that. Um, so inverse tangent, uh, again, is actually defined for all values. You can define it from negative infinity to positive infinity. Although, if you keep in mind, the tangent graph actually has a graph here, it has a graph here, and so on. So what happens is you're not going to have these stacked on top of each other. However, you can have inputs for all values of tangent. Here are the final graphs for the different inverse trig functions. And you can see the dotted in values that are taken out as part of the definition that forces them to be functions.